All right, here we go. Brand new Flyers Daily for the 29th of March, 2024. Flyers Daily presented by Ticketmaster. Make more memories live. Missed opportunity for the Flyers in a game that I felt like I saw this one coming, talked about it. This is one of those what I called the human nature games where you're going to have the letdown after the gauntlet. Uh, I talked about this on yesterday's episode that you got to find a way to fight through that and get a win. I didn't care how the win came or how you get the standings points. Style points didn't matter, uh, but they failed to do so as they go down in Montreal by a final score of 4-1. to Yeah, Caden Primo was good in the game, no doubt about it. Flyers outshot uh, the Habs 30-17. to I thought it was a pretty lackadaisical, casual first period for the Flyers. Didn't get inside, only had five shots on goal. I didn't think Montreal was that much better, to be honest with you, but they they capitalized on two chances right around the net. First one comes uh, on the power play when Nick Suzuki picks up his 30th of the season, and then the second one comes when Jesse Yulanen, uh right around the goal mouth, picks up a puck and is able to put it by Arison. Didn't blame it on Arison. Didn't think they were bad goals that he gave up, but I, I thought that Montreal just capitalized on it. That Yulanen goal. At eight or sixteen forty six of the first ends up being the game winner in this game. We'd end the first period. I think the shots were six to five after one period of play in favor of Montreal. And then you go into the second period. Flyers had some stretches in the second period where I thought they played well, but so did Montreal. Um, and then Flyers have two goals that are disallowed, and rightfully so. They were both challenged. They were both disallowed for good reason. One of them was uh, the goal that was kicked in by uh, Garnet Hathaway. Puck is laying in the goal mouth. Primo thinks he's got it covered. He doesn't. They're jabbing away at it, but it was clearly a kick and ended up in the net and was not allowed, rightfully so. And then the second one was offside uh, when Tyson Forster got in just ahead of the puck uh, in there as well. So they're able to get two by Primo, but neither of them count. And then you go into the third period, down 2 nothing in the game, and... Some good opportunities, great opportunities. Forster across the net front pass to Travis Konechny, who ended up hitting the post and then off the post and off Primo, doesn't go in. Morgan Frost had a great couple great opportunities as well. They just couldn't get anything by Primo. And then eventually with the goal he pulled at 17.05, Yoel Armia picks up the empty net goal, and that makes it 3-0. Flyers uh, get rid of the shutout for Primo when at 18.59, Owen Tippett, with an absolute laser beam from distance, is able to beat him. Got some traffic around him. Took his eyes away a little bit. Uh, Konechny and Hathaway pick up the assist. That made it 3-1. Could you have some last-minute magic? They didn't. Um, And eventually, at, I think, 1959, Jake Evans picked up the empty net goal, and that was the final 4-1 as Mike Matheson picked up three assists, and the Canadians end up beating the Flyers. And it's a missed opportunity. And it's also a dodge of a bullet at the same time, if that makes any sense. Now, here's why. It was a busy, busy night in the NHL. So the missed opportunity comes because you're facing a lesser opponent. This is the eighth-ranked team in the Atlantic Division. They've got 66 points on the year, and you got to take care of business against what you would deem as not just inferior, but significantly inferior opponents. And this just shows you that coming down the stretch, If you don't bring a game with enough intensity and detail and diligence that no matter who you play, you can come out of it losing. We see it all over the league. It happens every night at this time of year. Teams that are totally out of it, having no business beating teams that are fighting for their playoff lives. But that's the NHL. That's parity. So how do they dodge a bullet and also have a missed opportunity. Here's how. When you look at the games that took place last night, so the number one team chasing the Flyers, the closest to them and threatening their playoff position is the Washington Capitals, who come into the game one point back of the Flyers with two games in hand. So Flyers fail to get any points in game 74 of the season. They have eight left. The Capitals have game 72 of their season. They still have, what, uh, 10 games left. And the Caps go into Toronto, but they get beaten up pretty good. Five to one is the final. Toronto wins the game. So Caps don't make up any ground, even though you had a missed opportunity. Now, the Caps lost, 
to a team that is not inferior to them, is one of the good teams, one of their tough opponents, if you will. All right, so that's bullet dodged number one. Bullet dodge number two, another team that they're battling with, the Flyers, and this will be for the wild card if they slip into the wild card territory, is the Detroit Red Wings. The Red Wings had their 72nd game of the season last night, and they lost 4 nothing in Carolina against the Canes. So, Car- or the Red Wings, rather, have 79 points, five point or three points back of the Flyers with two games in hand. So those two teams didn't make up ground. Those two points that the Flyers could have got if they got a win last night would have been huge, though, because then you would have been at 84 points, and the Caps with two games in hand would only be three back. And you'd be at 84 points, and Detroit would be five back. But that's not the case. The one team that's trying to sneak back into this whole thing was a team that we thought was dead, came back to life, six-game win streak, went back to sleep, but now it's the New York Islanders who also played last night, game 72 of their season, but they got a win. So the Islanders now have 77 points, five points back of the Flyers with two games in hand, and let's take it a step further, the Flyers play the Islanders on Monday at Wells Fargo Center. The Islanders went into Florida and beat a really good Panthers team 3-2. to two. Went into the third period with a 3-2 lead and hung on in Florida. So things are tight as they get. Blackhawks will be at Wells Fargo Center. Connor Bedard's first visit to Philadelphia as the Blackhawks got shut out last night by Ottawa 2 to nothing. And that, I mean, look, you can say, no matter what, the next game is the most important one. You can't look past anything. Obviously, the Islander game is a big one on Monday because it's a four-point swing game. And if you need to look any further, that when you look at important games, this game on April 16th, game 82 for the Flyers, game 82 for the Washington Capitals, could be that if you win, you're in scenario. It absolutely could be. And Flyers have a little bit of an advantage here. Now, Washington and the Flyers, granted, Washington's played two less games, have 36 wins this season. Each have 32 wins in regulation and overtime wins. These are the tiebreakers. Regulation wins, 28. They're tied there as well. So each team has four shootout wins. Flyers have three shootout losses. Washington's got four shootout losses. Uh, but it's crazy when you look at the situation. Washington has not been great on the road, 16, 6, and 4. But Washington will be on a back to back on the 15th and 16th. Flyers will play Saturday, the 13th, have off Sunday and Monday before that final game on the 16th. This is just bananas. What is going on? It is absolutely bananas. And look, this is, it's stressful. It's frustrating that they didn't get any points last night. I was PO'd. They didn't get the second point in the game against the Rangers. But damn it, we're coming up on my birthday tomorrow, March, late March. And we've got this stress because the team's in this position again. This is what it's like to be in this. We haven't been in this position in a long time, probably since, what, 17, 18? Because in 2019, 20, the season ended early, the regular season, after 69 games because of the pandemic, and then Flyers were just going to the postseason. They weren't stressing it out all the way down to the end of the season, game 82. 17, 18, I can't remember how that played out, because I can't remember much at my age, but this is what it's like to be back in the mix and not be a team like the New York Rangers, who are obviously going to the playoffs, or the Boston Bruins. This is what this part of the equation is all about. And it's going to be tight down the stretch. Yeah, last night was a missed opportunity. But in some ways, it was also the dodging of a bullet. I didn't. I never thought you could have both of those things. And you know how they say two things can be true? You dodged a bullet, and you missed an opportunity. That seems weird. But that's what this end stretch is going to be like. It's going to be bananas down the stretch. And speaking of bananas, <laughs> not really speaking of bananas, but something that I absolutely 
did not see coming was some news that broke yesterday. As I woke up, eventually picked up my phone, trying to pick it up later and later each day, I see this story that Siaska Moscow ended Ivan Fedotov's deal. Now, Ivan Fedotov, of course, is the goaltender that was supposed to come over a couple years ago. Had a really good Olympics, had some really good statistical seasons. He was a draft pick of the Flyers way back in 2015. He was a, a seventh round draft pick, 188th overall, six foot six, 205 pound goaltender. He's a monster. He's a big, big boy. And he had some really good years in the KHL. Had a 931 save percentage when he was playing for Tractor in 32 games, a 925 in 26 games uh, in the 2021 season, same team. Then he went to Siaska Moscow. He had a 919 in 26 games. Then he had. Uh, the following year, a 914 save percentage. I don't care about goals against average. I care about save percentage uh, in 44 games. And then he had this year for Siaska Moscow, 914 in 44 games after completing that year of military service where he was sent to the Arctic Circle, for goodness sake. We thought maybe he was coming over. And he gets picked up by Russian authorities, says, go do a military service. And then it didn't look like he was ever going to come over. And then the double IHF ruled that the Flyers contract was valid and his contract wasn't valid there, but then he wasn't coming over and he signed a two-year deal with Siaska Moscow. And you figure, okay, that's over. The Flyers told his contract last year and then suspended his contract this year. And he played for Siaska Moscow this year, 914 save percentage, did really well and uh, pl had played in five playoff games, had a 916 save percentage. And all of a sudden with a year left on his Siaska Moscow contract, they let him out of it. They terminated his contract. What? Where the heck did that come from? So he had his contract terminated from Siaska Moscow, and that could pave the way now for him coming over to play for the Flyers, a ship that I thought sailed. It was an abrupt termination. And Siaska Moscow actually said the club thanks him, Ivan Fedotov, and wishes him good luck in his further career. Like, what, what an about face this is. So he's been under the contract for the Flyers. So if he came over and they got the visa issues worked out and say he got here Wednesday, he could play for the Flyers Thursday. The Flyers play Thursday? No, they play Friday. But anyway, he'd be available. And I, I, I just can't even believe it. I didn't think this was a possibility. Now, we've talked about Kolosov. Because he's under an entry-level contract, and he is in the process of coming over now as well. Danny Breer spoke yesterday. I think it's more likely that he'll go to the AHL. He's only 22, just turned 22 in January, I believe. But Fedotov's different because Fedotov is a bit older. Fedotov is 27, just turned 27 in November, much more mature in his game, still would have a... Decent amount to learn about playing over here because it is way different. You've all heard me tell the story about Semyon Varlamov, who played in the NHL, went back to Russia, played in the KHL for a couple of years, and then came back and played in the NHL and said, I had to relearn completely how to play in the NHL because of where shots come from, uh, because of traffic, how they attack you, totally different. So he'd have things to learn. But is there a chance that Ivan Fedotov could play a game for the Flyers this season? Absolutely. I'm not saying that's likely. There's still some hurdles to get through here, but they could activate his contract. Now you go, why would you activate his contract if he's only going to play like a game or two? Isn't that going to burn the year? Well, I would assume that they would know that they're working towards another contract next year. So maybe your two goalies next year are Sam Erson and Ivan Fedotov, and your goalies with the Phantoms are some combination of Cal Peterson. We'll see what Felix Hanstrom would decide to do. His contract's up after this. And Alexei Kolosov. And if that's the case, I'm playing Kolosov 50 games minimum. Let him get used to the North American game. He's got some more growth in his game that he's got to take care of. All, so this goaltending depth that they have organizationally is pretty incredible. Now, were they preparing knowing that maybe something was going to happen with former Flyer goaltender Carter Hart. Look, you may not have known what was going to happen, but there was a chance. So you prepare, you don't get caught, 
in a situation where if something does happen, you're not prepared for it organizationally. They were, and they did. So look, Fedotov was before that. Kolosov was drafted before that as well. But they went out in this year's draft and picked up two guys, Carson Bjarnason in the second round and Yegor Zavragin in the third round. So the goaltending depth, you have Harrison, who still needs, we still need to know if he's going to be a bona fide number one or how that's going to play out. And I think competition for the crease will be good for him and whoever he's competing with, whether that's Ivan Fedotov, Alexei Kolosov, maybe eventually Yegor Zavragin or Carson Bjarnason or who else. So you have Arison, and maybe next year, like I said, you have Fedotov. Then you have Kolosov developing, and we'll see how that development goes once he gets over to North America. And Kolosov had a good year. Look, at, with uh, Mink Steinema this year, 47 games, 907 save percentage, and uh, he had a 239 goals against average, a 925 save percentage in six playoff games this past year. At a 912 the year before in 42 games, and 906 and 22 the year prior to that, and a 911 before that. He is not the biggest of goalies. You look at Fedotov, 6'6, 205, big kid. Alexei Kolsov, not that, six foot. He's way under NHL average size. He he's, would be like UC Soros. And he moves a little bit like UC Soros. Very agile, great skating goaltender. Now, I don't mean skating like. He's going to go out on the ice and go up and down. The, that's not what I'm talking about. The way he moves as a goalie, his edge work, his box movements, his, how under control he is. At that size, he's going to need that. So uh, two very different goaltenders coming from the KHL. Kolosov, a Belarusian. Ivan Fedotov, a Russian, uh, coming from over from there. Both flyer draft picks. Then, as I mentioned, Carson Bjarnason, who this past year, look, there's a lot of development still to go for Carson Bjarnason who was taken in the second round, 51st overall by the Flyers in last year's draft. There's a lot of goaltending development that needs to take place. 46 games this past year to 9.07 on a not very good Brandon Wheat Kings team. He is 6'3", long, 205 pounds, but he's raw. So there's got to be some development there. He's taken in the second round. In the third round, they didn't expect Yegor... Zavragin to be there. He ended up being there and they couldn't pass him up. And this year he played in the uh, Russian MHL, which is like a notch down from the Continental Hockey League there. And he had a 249 goals against average and a 920 save percentage and some stretches of otherworldly play. So in 30 games, by the way. So he's another guy. So the, the goaltending depth is one of the most intriguing elements of this rebuild. When you look at a rebuild, there's some key elements you need to have. First and foremost, you got to have multiple draft picks, first round draft picks. They had two last year, two this year, two next year. I don't know if they're going to draft both players in the first round this year or next year. Maybe one of those picks is part of some package trade to do whatever now this summer or whenever. But it, it applies a lot of variability. That's number one. And then the second round picks in multiple seconds in all those drafts as well. You also picked last year, seventh overall, Matt Vemichkov, a, a guy that is ticketed to be a dynamic, scare the living crap out of the opposition superstar, score. And then you also picked a right side D with size in Oliver Bonk. He's got filling out to do. So that's what you accomplished last year. You also need to have good goaltending depth. And sometimes to find the right goaltender and make it a homegrown goaltender, you got to pick up a lot of guys because it's a lot of voodoo and there's a lot of, you know, development of goaltenders is tricky. So sometimes you have to have a little bit more numbers in that regard. High pedigree, and then you see who pans out and you hope that you have two of four or two of five goaltenders that you draft with some pedigree p turn into really good NHL goaltenders. Goaltender's tricky, though. And then you also need to have players on your roster, young players during a rebuild, stepping up, whether that's Owen Tippett or that's, I mean, Cam York's been unbelievable this year, in my opinion. And then you look at players like Morgan Frost figuring out who he is at NHL level with consistency and pressure. And on down the line we go, Tyson Forrester, all of this. 
That's what a rebuild is. And how this plays out, how these goaltending names that we just talked about, whether it's Erson, Fedotov, Kolosov, Zavragin, or Bjarnason play into this rebuild is bananas, which is right back where we started. This whole thing is bananas. What's going on for the remaining eight games of the season? It's going to be bananas. But damn it, things just mean more now. Flyers are, are a team that has been in the headlines, not only in Philadelphia, but around the NHL all year. Some So many intriguing storylines. And I saw somebody on Twitter say, man, the Flyers are just always drama around them right now. I think there was probably this much drama before. It just didn't matter as much. Team wasn't good. Team wasn't intriguing. Frankly, damn it, the team wasn't that likable. The organization wasn't that likable. So things have changed. All right, Flyers uh, tomorrow, going to be back at it. We'll preview Flyers against the Chicago Blackhawks and Connor Bedard's first trip to Philadelphia. That's coming up tomorrow. Join us then on a brand new Flyers Daily.